All right, guys, I'm sure most of you have seen at least uh, an article or even possibly the video of the Hawker 800 XP that crashed up in Michigan. Uh, and this was the first flight post-maintenance. Um, the aircraft took off. There was a little bit of confusion with air traffic control, which I'll talk about, uh, the human factors aspect of it. Ultimately, what they wanted was a block altitude to do a stall test. They had two pilots. These were not, from what I understand, these were not test pilots. They were just the pilots that flew the airplane for the cost for the owner of the airplane. And there was a maintenance personnel. So they stalled the airplane, uh, could not recover for whatever reason, and ended up crashing. If you go back in history, this is not the first time an aircraft has crashed uh, right after maintenance was done. I can remember three really notable ones. One of them was a, a Continental Express Brasilia. I think it was out of, uh, I want to say out of Texas. And it actually flew, I believe one or two legs uh, at, before it crashed, and they were doing maintenance on the elevator, I believe the boot, the de-ice boot on the elevator. They had switched maintenance shifts, and they didn't document it properly or do what was ever, whatever was required, and they didn't properly secure the top of the elevator, and I think on leg two or three, it, it came apart, and they ended up crashing, uh, killing everyone. There was also a Colgan, I wanna say Beach 1900, out of, I wanna say, Hyannis, where they improperly rigged the elevator and it took off and it um, ultimately stalled. They crashed. And then I believe it was another Beach 1900 in Mesa where they, I think, did the same thing, where they rigged the elevator control wrong and they took off. And this was, I believe, a, a uh, revenue flight and it killed everybody on board. And that was a really, really tough one because I think the, the CVR recorded a little girl screaming for her father right before they crashed. So. Post-maintenance flights, not something you take lightly, and most airlines, believe it or not, have actual test pilots that are not line pilots. I don't even believe they're seniority pilots. They are strictly test pilots to go out and maybe perform you know, whatever is required of the aircraft after maybe certain maintenance, or if they get a new aircraft and it has to display, um, for example, a stall test or something like that, they have dedicated test pilots that are probably held to a little bit higher of a standard than your regular old line pilot. And what I mean by that, it's, you know, hey guys, this airplane just came out of maintenance, go ahead and go fly it and go do some steep turns, so on and so forth. I believe there is a lot of ground planning and preparation that, that goes into, into play here if you're talking about doing that type. Which brings me to an interesting video that I've all, that I think most pilots have seen. If not, I'm gonna show it to you now. And it is a video of a 717 or DC-9 uh, full stall test demo. <laughs> And that's one thing about transport category airplanes. Guys, when I say transport category airplane, the beach is actually not considered a transport category airplane. Just kind of use these as swept wing jet and transport category interchangeable because I'm talking about, you know, high performance jets with the swept wing as well as like actual transport category airplanes like the 737. Sorry for the confusion. They break pretty violently. I have done extended, uh, at Spirit they called it extended envelope training. At United we call the upset recovery training and essentially what it is, you go into the full motion FA certified level D simulator. You go up to altitude and you put the aircraft into a deep stall, unusual attitudes, and you do all that, all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you, uh, it takes a significant amount of altitude to recover a transport category airplane from a full stall. And that is why almost every single, I can almost guarantee it, every single manual out there 
will tell you to recover from the first indication. Now, as far as the procedure for this Hawker 800 crew, I'm not familiar with what they discussed prior. I'm not quite sure how far into the stall they had to get. I found this in the manual, and I don't know if there's like a separate manual that the maintenance guys had for the type of stall or the maneuver, whatever they were gonna do, but the technique for stalls here, according to the manual, uh, stalls are to be made straight, wings level flight, so no banking stalls. Uh, stalls with flaps retracted and in the takeoff configuration should be carried out at idle thrust. So essentially you bring the power back to idle, you maintain level altitude, wait for the aircraft to just pitch up, pitch up to maintain it, and then it's gonna stall. Um, let's see. The airplane should be trimmed at an airspeed of approximately 1.4 VS1 in the appropriate configuration after setting the required thrust. The airspeed should be reduced at not more than one knot per second. Rapid or violent movements of any control during the approach to the stall should be avoided, particularly at airspeeds below the operation of the stick shaker. With the yaw damper off, any tendency to yaw during the approach to the stall should be corrected by normal use of rudder. If you stall an airplane and you're yawing, you're going to go into a spin. That's what causes spins. It's not so much being uncoordinated. It's just it's the actual yawing of the airplane that's going to put you into a spin. Uh, and finally here it says, the stall is identified by a short forward movement of the control column provided by the stall identification system. The red stall valve open, enunciators will illuminate. The airplane should be allowed to pitch nose down until the stick push has canceled and should then be recovered to normal controlled flight. Any tendency to roll should be corrected by use of the ailerons. Do not attempt to hold the airplane in the stall. That's one change that was hard for me to recognize or hard for me to get used to coming from general aviation airplanes to transport category airplanes is when you stall the airplane, you do not use the rudder. You actually do use the ailerons and that was kind of a change because in Cubs, 172s, whatever it is, when you stall, you do not want to touch the ailerons. You want all control to be with the rudder. So that was kind of a change there and that's very common among transport category airplanes. Uh, let's see, but do not attempt to hold the airplane in the stall. And that's the kind of that deep stall that I was talking about. And when we did it in the sim on the Airbus and the 7.3, if you hold these airplanes into a deep stall, it is very, very difficult to recover without having 20,000 feet of altitude. You really have to push down and, and regain a lot of energy. And it is not uncommon to see 10,000 foot per minute descents. There's a caution here. It says a frequent reason for unacceptable stall characteristics is a tendency to roll at the stall. So again, the airplane stalls and then you roll it and it's gonna break. It is acceptable for a moderate roll to occur provided that normal use of ailerons can limit the roll angle to no more than 20 degrees. 20 degrees is a pretty conservative bank angle. Uh, the pilot must be prepared to recover from an unusual attitude. Okay, so it's basically saying here that if you let the airplane kind of get away from that control flight, it is very possible that you're going to get yourself into an undesired aircraft state where it could roll violently and now you find yourself in an unusual attitude. Pilots conducting stall checks should have prior experience in performing stalls in Hawker and must be prepared for unacceptable stall behavior at any point leading up to and throughout the maneuver. This is, this is very, very important, okay? Again, pilots conducting stall checks should have prior experience in performing stalls in the Hawker and must be prepared for unacceptable stall behavior at any point leading up to and throughout the stall. This is why we talk about if you're a test pilot versus a regular line pilot that's asked to do something like this that you are unfamiliar with. Because even if you've done it in the sim or you've read about it, it is much different when you're actually up at altitude in the actual real life airplane doing this. And again, I have no idea if these pilots um, were certified test pilots or not. I'm just kind of bringing this up and just talking about it because I think it's worth discussing. Uh, let's see. Uh, there is no natural stall warning or aerodynamic buffet prior to the stall. This is another key thing here too. Uh, there's no natural stall warning. So you're not going to get a buffet like you would in a 172. It's just going to go from a flying wing to a non-flying wing and you have to rely on the, the enunciator or the pusher, shaker, or the oral warning in this case. So it says here, stall warning is provided by a stick shaker which is set to operate at an indicated airspeed of seven to 9% above the stalling speed. So why that's important, if you're going up to practice a stall, right, to make sure the system's working or whatever, you're gonna get the stall indication and recover before the actual wing stalls. If you hold it, if you hold it, the aircraft will stall, but at the first indication, you should not stall the wing 
because there is a buffer there, there's a margin. It's telling you the stall warning system is gonna activate seven to 9% above the stall speed. So again, if you recover at the first onset of a stall warning, the wing is not gonna stall, the aircraft's not gonna break or do anything crazy like that because the wing is not yet stalled. I don't know the experience of the pilots or if they were certified test pilots or not, so this kind of topic, even though it's a Hawker and I'm reading out of the manual, it's kind of a, a separate conversation. It's just something to kind of think about here because when they talk about the stall characteristics, to me, it becomes very abundantly clear that if you're going to go up and do this, uh, you have to be very, very familiar and have experience in doing this on this spe specific airplane. So to me, a, uh, a correct way of doing the actual stall test, the airplane is never going to be actually stalled. There's always something that could have happened to the actual airplane. I mean, it just came out of maintenance. And like I talked about earlier, there has been numerous cases of maintenance being done improperly on airplanes and it may have just shown its, uh, its ugly head as they were doing this maneuver. Don't yet know yet, hopefully the investigators will be able to find out. Getting a transport category airplane into a full stall is a very, very dangerous thing. There is the startle effect, even though you are waiting for it to happen, the aircraft can break violently, much like this, the 717 DC-9. Uh, you're staring at the ground, you're at 80 knots, and you just gotta keep it there and kinda aim for the ground to build up enough energy. And it's tricky too, because uh, when we did these in the sim, you know, you're staring out the ground, you're descending at 8,000, 10,000 feet per minute. Dang, dang. And if you pull up too quickly, you're going to get into a secondary stall. And if you don't pull up quickly enough, you're going to overspeed the airplane. Now, it's always better to overspeed an airplane than it is to over G it. But, I mean, how far into the barber pole are you going to get, right, before uh, stuff starts coming off the airplane? So it's a, it's a very, very tricky maneuver we'll call it and that's why I think it really should be dedicated to specific test pilots that are familiar with the airplane uh, especially if there's a chance that an, uh, this airplane can get into a spin because if you're going to spin a transport category airplane I would not feel comfortable doing it at 15,000 feet I mean you're going to lose a significant amount of altitude. Now the most important thing really in any stall recovery is has nothing to do with airspeed. It has nothing to do with thrust, especially if you're up at the higher altitudes, your thrust is not gonna do much for you. Uh, it's unload the wing. You have to unload the wing. I mean, you could have an aircraft doing 80 knots through the air and not stalled, and you can have an aircraft doing 400 knots through the air and the wing could be stalled. So it's all about unloading that wing. Uh, and another thing too with the with the Hawker, and I remember on the uh, on the Embraer, anytime you have the rear-mounted engines, the tail-mounted engines, uh, it helps in a stall with you coming with the thrust because it's going to pitch forward because of where the engines are. Whereas on a 737 or on an Airbus, uh, you have to be careful when you try to power out of a stall because when you power up the engines that are mounted underneath the wing, it's going to force the nose up, and that's always kind of an interesting thing in the sim. Is you unload the wing, you go to power up, and you can kind of you have to fight the airplane because it wants to pitch up on you. Now, in this case, that really wouldn't be an issue because on the beach, the engines are, are in the tail. So when you listen to the ATC recording, uh, I'm kind of a big human factors guy, and there's definitely some confusion. Now, usually when you fly, you have a pilot flying and a pilot monitoring. Well, what makes this case a little bit tricky is they were kind of had a confusion with air, air traffic control. They didn't, what they wanted was a block altitude, say 15,000 feet to 17,000 feet, so they could do the stall and recover. Obviously, you have to make air traffic control aware of that. And we hear that a, a few times out, especially when I was coming in and out of Atlantic City, you'd hear the tanker guys that were practicing refueling and say, hey, I want a block, block altitude of 10, 15,000 feet. Uh, so air traffic control will block off that airspace and go ahead from 10,000 to 15,000 feet in that area. That's all yours. You can do what you need to. So it's a simple request, but these pilots kind of had a hard time communicating that. And again, there's, you know, these pilots, their English was not perfect, and I wouldn't expect it to be because it seems as though they were uh, from Mexico. So there is that language barrier, but there was a little bit of confusion because I think they were stepping on each other, asking air traffic control both at the same time. And their controller, uh, he was patient, but he was kind of confused in what they really wanted. So there, there was a little bit of confusion there. Now that kind of brings it to, okay, maybe... Uh, maybe the pilots were unfamiliar with this actual maneuver. Maybe they were a little bit nervous, but whatever the case, uh, it seems like they were just not that on top of it. But again, that very well could be just the strict language barrier, right? I mean, maybe they just didn't know how to ask for it. So I'm not trying to blame the pilots. I'm just looking at it from a human factor standpoint. Based on kind of the conversation they had with air traffic control, it seemed as though maybe they were preoccupied with, uh, maybe they had a long day, who knows, but it was just kind of something that I, I thought was interesting because I know 
when I've had situations in the airplane, my communication with air traffic control is always not that great because my main focus is on what's going on with the airplane. And that's just kind of human nature that happens. And, you know, if this was a crew that had done this a million times before, um, it probably would not have been that big of a deal. But if this was their first time doing it, again, I don't know if it was, but it's just something to think about. If this was their first time doing it, it would kind of make sense that they were maybe a little apprehensive about doing it. Traffic at Mike Romeo, Cleveland Center, Sun Octavator, Trees are 1-6. Traffic at Mike Romeo, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, just for request, uh, work area for Los uh, you're just requesting a place to fly around for at one five thousand. Actually, after Julia Mike Remy, do you just need an area to fly around to uh, get some work done? Yes, sir. It's a flight uh, in thousand, but uh, uh, particular area of one thousand and around ten miles. Actually, after Julia Mike Remy, you're coming in pretty broken. Exactly what you need. Say it again. We need an area of ten miles around. Most of the time, thousand, but we could uh, we could climb one thousand or the, or or descend one thousand from our altitude. Actually, after Julia Mike Remy, I think both of you are stepping on each other, and it's coming in pretty broken here. So one at a time. Uh, what do you need? Yes, sir. Uh, this, uh, how do you hear me? Actually, I have to do that, Mike Kremlin. I hear you uh, loud and clear now, so try it again. Okay, sir. Uh, just for request that work area uh, and uh, 15,000 and between the 2,000 and plus less uh, for work area. Actually, Jill and Mike Romo, you need a work area at 15,000, and are you going to be going plus and minus altitude? Is that what you're trying to say, or no? Sure, but if so, between, between 14 and 15, uh, 16,000 area. Actually, Jill and Mike Romo, you're fighting 360. Like it in 360, I'll fight you the car. Actually, Jill and Mike Romo, maintain block 14,000 through 16,000. Okay, one four thousand and one six thousand. Extra, thank you very much. Extra, thank you, Mike Romeo. Do you need anything else? No, sir. Thank you very much. No problem. Let me know if you do. Thanks. Extra, thank you, Mike Romeo, Cleveland. We are in it. It's all recovery, sir. It's all recovery. Sorry. Extra for Julia, Mike Romeo, Cleveland Center, say altitude. So I just, I, I listened to that and just something kind of I thought about. Uh, as well as when the aircraft is into the stall, you know, they key up the mic and say, you know, stall recovery, stall recovery, and you can hear it in the pilot's voice. And it's kind of, it's hard to, it's hard to listen to because, you know, as pilots, you don't ever want to hear that. But again, you know, if you're in that situation, uh, you know, is that, is that a Hail Mary that you're reaching out to air traffic control and kind of telling them what's going on? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. And again, we'll find out, hopefully, what caused this, because we have no idea yet. These are just kind of thoughts, things that I'm thinking, uh, or, or based on what I've read so far. These pilots are very type A. We kind of want to figure out what happened, because it's very, as a pilot, it's kind of, it's, you get an uneasy feeling when an airplane crashed, and you don't know why, because you want to be able to learn from it to make sure that it, it doesn't happen to you. Um, so it's very common for us to kind of talk about it, and I'm not pointing fingers. I don't know why it happened just kind of thinking out loud, reading through the manual, and just finding some things that I think are maybe worth having a conversation over. Um, so any questions or anything or any uh, inconsistencies that I said, just leave a comment, shoot me an email, uh, shoot a message, and I'll, I'll gladly correct them. All right, guys, thanks.